everybody, Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. Well, here we are. It's Thursday here on this program. we got a lot of news to talk about here today. Last night, AEW Dynamite. Did you guys watch the Dynamite show? A lot of stuff happened on that show, including that promo by MJF. What would you think of that promo? I have, in fact, heard... Uh, Mixed reviews about that promo here today. I thought the promo was fantastic, but there were people critical of it. We can talk about that here on the show today. We got uh, some notes on some new AEW signings. Jeff Hardy appears to be heading to AEW. We have got uh, Shane Strickland, Swerve, is heading to AEW as well. And uh, a lot of other fallout heading to the pay-per-view. They also announced the Double or Nothing show, which is heading to Las Vegas, Nevada, Sunday, May 29th at the T-Mobile Arena. We're going to give you details on that. It does appear that Dave and I are going to be doing a live Q&A from uh, Double or Nothing weekend and uh, potentially doing a convention in Las Vegas that weekend as well. So if you're thinking about going to Vegas think hard we've got elimination chamber raw ratings we have got nxt ratings for nxt 2.0 not sure how much mike talked about that show yesterday and uh madcap moss cleared after being dropped right on his head bill goldberg recovering from covid which actually led to his match with uh, roman reigns he had very little time to prepare for that match and a uh, number of other notes as well and of course the aw recap from uh wednesday night and if you guys want to talk about NXT 2.0, we can do that one as well. So a lot of stuff to get into today. If you want to text us, 425-780-7566 is the phone number. That is 425-780-7566. Brian at WrestlingObserver.com. At Brian Elvers on Twitter. Back in a moment with more Observer Live. Holding down the fort yesterday. Is that right, Mike? I did indeed, sir. Did you recap NXT 2.0? I did. Really? I did. Wow. I did. Uh, yeah. Maybe I won't, All maybe I won't of that today. effort, too, to get to Dolph Ziggler and Tommaso Ciampa, but uh, it was worth it for that, almost. Hmm. almost. Well, we're going to talk about AEW mostly here today, and uh, that includes this MJF promo. Did you guys watch this promo with MJF? Yeah. I watched this thing, and I thought, my God, just look at this guy. One of the great promos. Just an absolutely fantastic promo. But I did hear people critical of it. Why? Well, I'm going to get into it here. So what basically happened was, and uh, I, I told everyone on Observer Radio last night, as I woke up the entire neighborhood, because we've moved to uh, or a room in the Marriott right now, which is different from a house that sleeps 16. So I have to be a little more calm, collected. 16? Not my uh, forte. 16? But as I, as I struggled not to wake up the entire house... I said, you know what, I'm going to try and recap this the best I can in one minute. Well, obviously, when a guy cuts a 12-minute promo, you can't do it just in one minute. So all I heard this morning was, ah, he forgot to talk about this. Give me a break, blokes. If you want to see the promo, go watch the show. So anyway, MGF comes out in tears, and he says, the gist of this, I'm going to give you the one-minute version. MGF had learning disabilities in school. And the only thing he was good at was football. And he tried out for the football team. He made the team. And then he shows up and he's expecting all these guys to be his buddies. But instead, they show up and they got rolls of quarters and they throw them at MJF and they call him Jew Boy. And he's just absolutely devastated. He's got enough problems as it is. But that night, he says, that night was the night that he met CM Punk for that photograph that CM Punk held up a week ago. And he says, he's in, he's tears streaming down his face. He goes, uh, yeah, CM Punk said that this was just a Friday for him, but to me it was everything. And this totally turned my life around, meeting CM Punk. And he said, you know, I grew up and all I cared about was wrestling and I wasn't all that great at school, but I was good at football. I got all these football scholarships, but I didn't care about football. All I wanted to be was a wrestler. And he studied it, and he watched the shows, and he was obsessed. And then one day, his hero, the man that he had met that turned his life around, CM Punk walked out of WWE. He quit. And, of course, what I thought was so clever about this is 
you know, if you know the story of CM Punk, and CM Punk has said it himself, the best thing that he ever did for himself was to, was to walk out. And it was a miserable existence. His body was racked with pain. He was dying. He was dying inside and out, and he had to get out. But there were fans who were angry at him for what was doing what was, what was best for CM Punk. They called him a quitter. They said he walked out. He was a loser. Well, MGF's character is one of those guys. How dare you walk out on me? And so he was so upset that he was just done with this whole wrestling thing, and he went to school, and he did the whole college thing, and, and he gave up on his dreams. But then one day he woke up and he said, you know what? I want to be a wrestler. I want to be a professional wrestler. I know that CM Punk walked out, but you know what? I, MJF, am not going to be a quitter. I'm not going to walk out. I'm going to be the best there ever was at this thing because CM Punk quit, and I am better. I am better than CM Punk. And he knows it. So he has this this whole story and he's crying and talking about his difficulties and struggles and Punk walking out and almost ruining his life. And CM Punk walks out and he's just no music. He's just morose. He gets in the ring and he looks at at MJF and he just says, is this true? Is this a true story? And MJF, he just stares at the guy for a while and then he says, it's true. And he drops and he rolls out of the ring and he walks to the backstage area. Now, How could you watch this promo and have criticism, you ask? Well, I'll tell you how. I heard from people that said, you know what? This was like the best babyface promo like of all time. And and I cared about this feud. And now how can I care about this feud? How can I boo a guy who had quarters thrown at him, slurs, uh, learning disabilities that he fought through to become? How could I possibly boo this man? You know what I say to these people? Well, you know, if you want to have that opinion, you're welcome to. Everyone's welcome to their opinion. But I'm going to say what those stand-up for WWE blokes say, and that is, let's see how this plays out. Because there's, there's there's two possibilities here, okay? There's, and I think there's only two. The first possibility is that next week, MGF beats this guy down, leaves him for dead, and he says, I lied! I made up that whole story! Or, or, it turns out that this is a way to add even more depth to the character of MJF. And, uh, and we find out that, in fact, this is all true. But this guy had a, a horrible, he had a horrible uh, time growing up. And that is what has made him who he is. And it has not made him who he is in a way where he's going back and he's like, you know, I'm going to correct these mistakes. I'm going to be the best person. Instead, he's going to go about this the wrong way. He's going to do, think about every villain. I'm not even talking about villains on television, but I'm not going to glorify anybody in particular because it's not something to glorify. But without saying any particular name, think about, uh, you know, some of the most uh, infamous, and I don't want to compare MGF to a serial killer, but there have been serial killers, and you know what? They had horrible upbringings. They had horrible, horrible things happen to them when they're children. Do we cheer them for Of course not! They had, they had horrible things that happened to them, which is, it's terrible that that happened, but this is not the way to go about dealing with these issues. And I think that's what we're doing with MJF here. Oh, he's going to beat down CM Punk, and he's going to leave him for dead, and he's going to use these horrible things that happened to him to be an even more horrible person. Do you cheer a person who had a bad thing that happened to them but responded by doing much worse things? I don't think so. I think that's where we're going. And then, of course, eventually down the road, this guy can turn babyface. He's got a babyface story if there ever was one. And I think, that, uh, I think, that's, I think that's how we're going to let this play out. But I've been wrong before. We shall see. Isn't pro wrestling great? I mean, that's what this is. This is pro wrestling. It's very simple. It's a story being laid out. You have a heel who's got real things that have happened to him. We're bringing in reality into wrestling. That's when wrestling is usually the best, when there are elements of fans believing that something is real, whether a conflict between the two or a backstory or whatever it is. And that backstory with MJF, much like any 
character in a film or a TV show or a professional wrestling show. There's layers to everybody. Wasn't the penguin in Batman, wasn't he an ugly baby that was dropped into a river and sent off? Started his life in a terrible way. He went on, obviously, to be a terrible person, tried to take over Gotham. But that's not how you do things. And I think that's the direction that we're going here with MJF. With more making now CM Punk feel bad about walking out, feeling his mental health, MJF's mental health baggage being put on CM Punk, who was trying to improve his. But every action has a reaction. There are shades of gray, and this is where the shades of gray in pro wrestling have gone crazy with, is it, no, we got to have, it doesn't matter about heels and baby faces. No, it's about layers to a character. Harvey Keitel movies are always great. Bad Lieutenant, uh, Reservoir Dogs, movies where there's a lot of characters, and even the best ones have had awful things happen to them, and sometimes those good people do awful things. CM Punk's probably done awful things. MJF is bringing up one now that he thinks it was done to him. And that's why sometimes, especially newer pro wrestling fans, like you're not going to be satisfied all in one shot, maybe not all in one week, one month. If they're telling a good proper story, sometimes there's layers to it. And sometimes their job, in fact, all the time their job is to make you emotional and to draw you in and to make you upset sometimes as long as they keep you coming back. I thought it was brilliant. We could get into it more. I thought the layers of it were fantastic. What do you, what do you wordle blokes think about this? Text me, 425-780-7566. Back in a moment. Observer Live. Um, yeah, we moved to a, a secure location here. <laughs> the Marriott. God. So is it a courtyard? Or what do you got? Extended stays? Bro, I went... No, it's uh, it's actually a really nice Marriott, except it's old, and so the walls are made of, like, cement or something like that. I went from a house that was built, like, uh, three years ago that had, like, one gig up, one gig down internet, which, oh, look at how great the shows are. Well, now I'm here at, with uh, five megabits up and zero down or something. Ah! <laughs> I'm doing my best, everybody. Man. All I ask is internet. Doesn't always work out. How's the fam, by the way? <laughs> They're good. <laughs> Did Brian just cut out again? I think Brian has dropped again. <laughs> I think so. Oh, tremendous. Oh, that's fantastic. So after that little diatribe, yeah, see, it's true. <laughs> It'll be back up shortly, I guess. Here we go. Uh, no, no, maybe. No, yeah, yeah. Uh, sad, 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 sad situation there. A situation that MJF would make fun of. I don't care how sensitive and inside of his feelings he is right now on, on CM Punk or anything else for that matter. He would still make fun of Brian, as we all are inside right now. Just yeah, I thought, I thought shutting down Twitch might make things easier, but I was, I was wrong. Whatever. Let's just get going with this show. All right, what should I try to this Dynamite Report, or is this, is this a total waste of time? Because no, I'm go get, ahead, and uh, I'll just pick it up again, if you drop out. Absolutely atrocious internet situation here. I'll do the news first, and maybe it'll, it'll stabilize in time for, uh, for the Dynamite Report. Jeff Hardy says he is AEW bound. How do we know this? Well, he did an interview, and he said, and I quote, I'm going to AEW. Hmm. So it looks like he's going to AEW. Yeah. Uh, Hardy confirmed he's headed to AEW in his 90-day no-compete clause expires, released December 9th following an incident at a house show where he left the ring during a match. Uh, they made several references to erratic behavior, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, he's on his way in. And also uh, signed with AEW is Swerve Shane Strickland. He's heading in. Haven't heard anything about Top Dollar. Guess we'll have to wait on that one. But uh, Swerve is coming in, and uh, he joins Buddy Matthews, who debuted last night. And they did a Swerve. It was actually infuriating Swerve to me. They teased that he was going to uh, attack Malachi Black. And I was all excited because uh, they had two awesome matches on Raw. And let me tell you something. If you can have an awesome match on Raw, think about the match you would have on Dynamite. Because how many times <laughs> have I watched two great workers and I go, you know what? If these guys would wrestle like anywhere else on the face of this earth, any other promotion, the match would be better. Not saying it's like a bad match. You know what you're going to get with a WWE match? But if you've got like Ricochet in there and you're doing Ricochet and, uh, and the former Aleister Black, like 
pick any promotion on the face of the planet, including CMLL, and they would have had a better match there than the match that they're allowed to have on Raw. Well, they they went back and forth, and they teased they were going to fight, but instead they teamed up together, as pretty much everybody expected. So uh, three new big debuts, and uh, Tony Khan is promising something that he says is equivalent to the CM Punk last uh, first dance, actually, surprise. The last dance is coming up, I'm sure, in a few years at the uh, United Center. But I have no idea what it could be. He says it's a huge deal. I don't know if it's a person. I don't know if it's a deal. I don't know what it is. But uh, that's the update on those things. We had uh, ratings notes, Raw and NXT. Raw did 1.83 million viewers in a .51, which was the best number since the draft, which they should be going up because it's WrestleMania season. And uh, no more uh, football competition till that XFL kicks off. We got uh, 8 p.m. 1.95 million viewers, 9 p.m. 1.87 million viewers, and 10 p.m. 1.67 million viewers. So a uh, good number for Raw on Monday night. This was coming off Elimination Chamber. And then the NXT show on Tuesday, 612,000 viewers and uh, 0.12 in 18 to 49, which is uh, up. That's good. I mean, uh, not that good, but anyway, that's the uh, NXT number. And I heard, I don't know if you talked about this, Mike, but that uh, Rampage show on Friday night, they, uh, they aired the show at 7 instead of 10. And the big question was, should they move to 7 as opposed to doing it at 10 o'clock? Because the idea that you're going to air it after SmackDown and like all these people are going to, you know, they're going to be done watching the Roman Reigns segment. They're going to go watch Dynamite. Not happening. Different audiences. So would it be better to go at 7 o'clock Friday instead of 10? We don't have an answer because the viewership was lower, but the demo was higher. And I did hear from a whole bunch of people that uh, flat out forgot that it was airing at 7 o'clock. So given that you know there were people that forgot about the show and the 18 to 49 was bigger, I think that maybe 7 o'clock might be better on Friday nights, but we don't have enough of what I like to call data to know for sure. But that's the direction I'm kind of leaning right now. I don't think you want to find out either. I don't think you want to put it on there for a protracted period of time and to find out because I don't think it's going to work. I don't like 6 p.m. Central time. I don't like 4 p.m. Western time, even though you may get more 12 to 17s or however they look at that particular demographic i think you may get that but i think you lose out on prime time advertising now if those things are equal okay we know that takes that out of the equation but i think you still have a better shot being on at 10 o'clock it's still not good friday night is just i don't know what the answer is for friday night i mean i really don't because there's so much going on people go out we've seen it with younger people you know friday to saturday if they're going to go out tends to be friday saturday sports can and big events can you know to kind of take away from you but i i just don't know what the answer is they'll never be on sunday they'll never be on thursday with the nfl uh, in Monday, obviously, and, and they don't want to go up with Raw anyway. So Friday is going to be the night. To me, I, I think maybe a replay, putting a replay, maybe spreading out where you put that replay. I know it's going to sound corny. I've been a proponent of somehow building something from AEW into Adult Swim. That hasn't happened. But throw it on True TV. Throw both shows on True TV. I mean, they run like the same Carbonaro effect or whatever the hell the name is of that show. Like they play the same stuff over and over. Try to get it on other properties. Put it different places. So even though you may miss it, and I know people, oh, they'll just DVR it. Look, there's a lot of people who don't set their DVRs and who missed the show because they didn't set their, they forgot about it and didn't set their DVR for it. So, to me, that's the only way on Friday I think you can maximize the impact is by replays in other places. And hey, catch this thing live. You don't want to miss it live. It's still going to be tough to do, but I think that's the only thing you can do if you're going to keep the show on Friday. I mean, it, it's just a tough, tough night. All right, uh, according to PW Insider here, WWE star Cesaro 
has quietly exited WWE after his current contract expired. PW Insider has confirmed. He last performed for WWE on February 11, losing to Happy Corbin on an episode of Friday Night SmackDown. We are told the two sides have been in negotiations, but had not come to terms on a new agreement. This would be a case of his contract expiring, so there would be no 90-day non-compete. He was supposed to be at SmackDown, but will obviously no longer be there. So there you go. It looks like Cesaro is out of here. And uh, I cannot say that uh, Cesaro, I know some people believe that Cesaro is like the most underrated guy in WWE in like a decade. I would not say that because uh, at least a guy like Cesaro was a multi-time tag team champion. Like they put him and Sheamus together, multi-time tag team champion. Like what have they ever done with Ricochet? Zilch. Like I don't even think Ricochet has won the 24-7 title, which is... uh, Every geek gets that one. So I would not say that he is the most underutilized performer in WWE, but I would say if you had to make like a top five, he would absolutely be among the most underutilized talents that they've ever had in that company. So we'll see where he goes next. I mean, AEW is signing a lot of guys, so who knows? But New Japan, New Japan strong, or maybe he's saved his money and he doesn't need to go anywhere. We'll find out soon enough. I'm sure he's probably saved his money. I'm sure he's saved enough of it to do anything that he wants because everybody's going to want him, so he's going to have the pick of the letter because it's another great example of somebody that is superfluous for WWE, somebody that they, you know, just another guy that they don't have to use, they don't need to use, they don't want to use, that everybody else can be made better by. You put him on any show, Blood sport and a grappling match against Ren Narita. Uh, you put him on some goofy show where he and Tom, Filthy Tom, just have, you know, kettlebell competitions. You put him on a match in a technical match. You bring him back and do an IWA tribute and he wrestles in Indiana against somebody. You can put Cesaro anywhere. Sorry, excuse me. You can put Claudio Castagnoli anywhere. Oh, and what- his government name his 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 government name his shoot name is that what yes. we're doing now i'm saying it because his buddy too by the way chris hero i don't know what's going on with ring of honor but boy a rebooted ring of honor on the very first show having kings of wrestling against the briscoes would love to see it uh, anything yeah. you do with him i think is fantastic I, and i will say this I don't know exactly how the whole world sometimes of these seminars work, whether they're put on by promoters and how much are like grabs and all that stuff. But I tell you what, whatever it costs for that seminar, if you're a young wrestler, he may be somebody you want to go and talk to. Back in a moment, Blokes Observer Live. So uh, this weekend, there was a Elimination Chamber show, and uh, Drew McIntyre was facing Madcap Moss, gave him a move, Madcap decided, I got a great idea, I'm going to tuck my head on a bump that I'm supposed to take flat, landed on his head and neck, thought he was dead, and uh, then he went backstage and said he felt good. Not just I'm all right, he said, I feel great! (laughs) So of course, you know, when things like that happen... Uh, we've seen this before with a lot of guys. Uh, yeah. That's know. that's why they always tell you, take the ride to the hospital. Get in an accident, something Ricky happens, take the Starks. ride. Ricky Starks. Take it. And, uh, I mean, I can rattle off 100 guys, but uh, mm-hmm. Ricky Starks is the most famous edition of this uh, edition I called Ricky Starks. Anyway, so <laughs> they they checked him out, and they said, hey, you're all right, no concussion, you're okay. And I thought, is he really all right? We've seen this one before. Well, mm-hmm. he got home. And uh, they gave him, as I like to call in the medical field, a battery of tests. They hooked him up to diodes and stuff like that. And it turns out he's fine. They, got, they gave him x-rays. They did the whole nine yards. And uh, no structural issues to uh, Madcap Moss. So this dude is uh, incredible. Impossible. Uh, but he is, uh, he is fine. 
That's why you work your neck in wrestling and football. That's <laughs> one of the reasons why, because you may fall on it in weird ways, and somebody may hit you in a weird way, and that's the only thing you can do to protect yourself. Magnum TA, that car accident he had would have killed anybody, and because of his, the size of his neck was one of the things that ended up helping him out, and it's just he's very, very lucky. But that's also why it doesn't matter if anybody says they're okay Still go and get yourself looked at. Obviously, a lot easier when you're in WWE when it comes to paying for some of this stuff. But in on the indies anywhere, man, you got to try to do what you can because some things don't come up until later. It's 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 not exactly the same, but it is. Bob Saget hitting his head, going to sleep, you know, then, you know, this stuff happens. So you've got to do the best you can to get yourself checked out because some things, once the adrenaline wears off, can come and sneak up on you a day later, several days later, swelling takes over, bad things can happen. So again, if you can do the best you can to get yourself worked out, don't just let things go. All right, let's do this AW report here. Got comments on my quote, blonde hair. It's, uh, yeah. What? Uh, there is uh, nothing. My, you know, what my hair is my hair is like Vince McMahon's hair in the eighties, oh, where yeah? someone's got to make a comment on every show, and I have done nothing to my head. I what? haven't cut my hair. What? I haven't even washed my hair since the Disney cruise, much less cut it or whatever. It looks like you got it frosted, Brian. I, I hear term, white. I hear frosted. gray. I hear brown. I hear frosted. I didn't do nothing to it. It's I went to Hawaii. Frosting. You blonde frosting. They put the net on you. They pulled the hair out. They foiled it up, and that's what happened. Yeah. Uh-huh. Look at you. What's up with those sideburns, too? By the way, let's talk about those. I haven't done anything. Look at my beard. I shaved, and then I forgot my razor. So it's just it's out of control now. You going to go Can up a little going? bit and take out those sideburns, or what? A E W. <laughs> AEW Dynamite. Open with a battle royal where the final team is one of uh, three teams in a three-way. Uh, next week, they're going to do a casino battle royal because, man, this Tony Khan, this bloke loves battle royals. And uh, the first half of this battle royal, we had uh, Best Friends, Butcher and Blade, Alex Reynolds, John Silver, Gun Club, FTR, Santana and Ortiz, Red Dragon, 2.0, Private Party, and the Young Bucks. A lot of teams, a lot of great teams in AEW. First half of this match, Geek Battle Royal. Oh, man. Then it got down to like six teams. And then it got down to the final four. Matt Jackson, Kyle O'Reilly, Dax Harwood, and John Silver. And uh, they they had a great little match right here. And the finish is just awesome. It's uh, Matt Jackson and Kyle O'Reilly, who are supposed to be like buddies. And they're in there with, with Silver. And uh, Kyle O'Reilly does something, and he goes, ah, my shoulder, I can't throw him out, throw this guy out. So Matt throws him out, and then Kyle runs up and throws Matt out. It was a swerve, and this crowd went crazy for this swerve, and, uh, and it was great. So Red Dragon is in the, the tag team uh, three-way. Bucks hit the ring. They're upset that they got uh, swerved. Hangman hits the ring. He goes after Red Dragon. He's upset about them attacking him last week. Adam Cole tries to attack Paige. Paige lays him out. Red Dragon saves him, although the Young Bucks refuse to save Hangman Page. so they're still doing the slow build to Hangman and the Young Bucks getting back together. Paige hit the buckshot on O'Reilly, and then he challenged Adam Cole for the belt at the uh, pay-per-view and uh, and that was that. And it's, it's interesting when I watch this because at this point, and can I repeat what a big fan I am of uh, Adam Cole? At this point, I firmly believe that we're not supposed to think Adam Cole has any chance of winning this match. Am I the only one? They've not done tr- nothing to convince me that this guy can win. Nothing. Nope. And a uh, MG- we had talked about the MGF promo in detail. I could talk more about it with Vinny tonight. Then we had the Death Triangle against the Kings of the Black Throne. It is Pac and now Penta Oscuro, Dark Penta, against Malachi Black and Brody King. No heat for this match. Match was good, but no one cared until they did this one awesome spot where Brody chopped Pac off the shoulders of, uh, of Penta, which led to a... Uh, accidental accidental reverse frankensteiner so that was awesome so uh then it ended up with uh malachi black getting pinned after he tried to blow the mist but penta covered his mouth so he swallowed his own mist 
That ain't good. And uh, then he got rolled up and pinned. And then they went for the beatdown afterwards. The lights went out. Buddy Matthews showed up. They teased he was going to go after Malachi. But it was a swerve. He is with the uh, Kings of the Black Throne. And uh, he beat up Penta, curb stomped him onto a chair. And that was that. We had a Jericho and Eddie Kingston confrontation, which was uh, very interesting because Eddie Kingston's a great promo and total baby face to this crowd. And uh, Jericho was making it abundantly clear. He's not a good guy in this storyline. He's talking about how when Eddie Kingston first showed up, he thought he looked like a jobber. He'd never heard of him before. But then he saw he went a match, and he was impressed with the guy. But he has seen a flaw in Eddie, and that is that all of Eddie's heroes were failures. And Eddie Kingston, whether he knows it or not, he fancies himself a failure as well. And he can't win the big one. And the biggest one in all of AEW is Chris Jericho. And he's not going to be able to beat him at the pay-per-view. But if he does, he says he will shake Eddie Kingston's hand, look him in the eye, and tell him that he has the utmost respect for him. And uh, Kingston basically said, dude, if we wrestle, I don't want this, this dude that did a mimosa match. I want this guy that's bled buckets, this guy that Levesque hated. I want the toughest, meanest Chris Jericho that he is. And Jericho says, you're going to get all that and more. And I still think that you're a loser. And I don't know where they're going. This is another one of those Jericho things. I don't know where they're going here because ultimately, ultimately, Eddie Kingston is going to beat Chris Jericho. Should he beat him in the first match? I don't yes. think so. Yes, I think should. that I think that you know what I think they should do because because Jericho's clearly the heel here. I think that they should go and Eddie's like he's right on the verge of winning, and Jericho is forced to cheat to beat Eddie Kingston, and then you go to a second match down the road where he gets yeah. his big win. I don't know. You know what I actually like out of that exchange? Remember when Jericho would lose and go nuts? Remember when he'd really be a prick in WCW and he, he just freaked out and would go nuts? That's kind of what I would like to see here. I would actually like to see Eddie Kingston get that win. And with everything going on with Jericho right now, all this strife and stress with the inner circle, uh, are Santana and Ortiz actually with them? Where has Jake Hager been? He comes, he goes, he's not really here. Sammy doesn't really want to be with him. I'd like to see him, Kingston, get that. That big win Jericho shake the hand then maybe Jericho turn on him or we get something where we get maybe a new look on Jericho that's one thing and he, nobody can take away from Chris Jericho the fact that he's been able to reinvent himself and stay relevant and latch on to things and be in the mix somehow Cody's out Cody didn't want to be the heel Jericho he's got no problem being the heel so maybe this can be a new look and maybe the, the fresh coat of paint one more time on Chris Jericho for, uh, for, for something with the inner circle, because I think that's done. I want to see Santana and Ortiz in a, as a team, and that's the only other thing I'll say about the show until you're done. Tag teams, they got plenty of them. I'd love to see coherent tag team angles, stories they can interweave, but let's get some damn tag team wrestling that doesn't have to do with three ways or battle royals or any of that stuff. You know, I have another thing that I love in wrestling that I don't see enough of these days, which if you really want to extend this feud, this is, this is actually one of the ideas that I had with, uh, when I was feuding with Marco Stunt. But uh, life intervened. But they also did this with, uh, with uh, um, I think this was, they may have actually skipped the middle portion when they did that Kurt Angle versus Edge feud years ago that I loved. But you do a three-match feud, and the heel wins the first match clean. So Jericho would beat Eddie Kingston. No shenanigans. He just beats him, okay? And he rubs it in that you can't win the big one, and he's just the biggest jerk, and Eddie Kingston's all fired up and angry. Now Eddie's like, man, you know, maybe I did, in fact, have this inside me that I like being the, uh, that I like being the, whatever the term they used was, you know, uh, a failure. But, dude, I, nah. So he wants a rematch. This is the match where he, he's, he's got this thing won, and the guy, boom, he's forced to cheat to beat him. Then you do the third match. Eddie Kingston thwarts the cheating, and he gets the win clean, and he proves he can win the big one. I like that three-match storyline. That's my favorite to get over a guy with the, uh, 
you know. Well, Brian, and you know why story. that works too is in a in a place like AEW where you do 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 have longer term storytelling and you do have layers to characters that should matter, New Japan, all that sort of stuff. You always have the ability to come back, no matter how that baby face conquers and stands victorious over that person who has you know beaten them twice. As great as that is, and as much as fans will forget about the fact that that person won two matches against their favorite. That's what's always one thing you can bring back. I still beat you twice. We're still, you know, you're still not even yet. You got your little win, but you're, we're still not even yet. So that's another reason to do it that way. We had Ricky Starks uh, winning a spot in the ladder match, beating 10. Jade Cargill beat the Bunny uh, with Jaded. And then afterwards, they had Ty Conti come out. One nine hundred nine oh nine ninety nine hundred two dollars. Who is the first calling minute. me on a landline in the middle of a radio show? Golly. Ninety-nine cents each additional minute. Get your parents' permission. Ty Conti. Ty Conti then came out, so it's Ty Conti versus. I'm just gonna just plow right through it like it's a Dave show. So they're <laughs> oh, gonna be facing off in the pay per view. <laughs> and uh, then the main event was Bra- uh, Brian Danielson and Daniel Garcia. Dave's not here, so I'll tell you what I really think about this match. I told you last night, but he tried to tell me that they were. Anyway, the whole story of this match was that there was going to be violence. Daniel Garcia says, I'm going to show you violence. Brian Danielson says, I'm going to show you violence. Then the match starts and Danielson goes, show me the violence, buddy. Show me the violence. Well, I didn't see enough violence from Daniel Garcia. Low-level violence. Then Dave goes, well, they promised technical wrestling violence. What? I didn't what even in see God's that. God's name is technical wrestling violence. Not that. Then Brian Danielson goes, did he show you enough violence to the fans? They're like, no, of course not. We agree with Brian. And then uh, a bunch of stuff happened after. We went from that. violence to violins. Look at this. I mean, it was a fun <clears throat> match and all, but uh, I was I was underwhelmed by the amount of violence displayed to me by uh, young Daniel Garcia. I was promised violence. All the violence was from Danielson. And I'm going to violently take you to a break. Observer Live. Well, the mystery of the telephone appears to be solved. Here to be the front desk telling me a bunch of stuff I already knew. Like, shut up, you're too loud up there? No, none of that. Yeah, Come pick up your kids or shouted last around? night about technical violence, but it was 2 a.m. in the morning and I had to be quiet. It was hard. <laughs> oh, man. Aye, aye, aye. Hey, you know, with the, the Young Bucks uh, being on the ballot this year for the 2022 Wrestling Observer Newsletter Hall of Fame, two teams that are not the Briscoe Brothers and the Kings of Wrestling, I would argue, even though the Young Bucks are great and belong to a spot in the Hall of Fame, I liked watching the Kings of Wrestling and Briscoe Brothers more. And I say the position that the Young Bucks have on that ballot should be taken care of in a three-way between all of those teams so all of my old ROH fantasies can come back and be relived again. Well, blokes, we're going to wrap it up for today. Tonight, tonight, it is the uh, Brian and Vinny show, which thankfully we're going to go live at uh, 10 Pacific, 1 Eastern, which is only 8 o'clock here in Hawaii, so I'll be able to... uh, I won't have to worry about screaming in the middle of the night. I can get away with screaming, I think, at 8 o'clock p.m., after 10, I think they uh, they frown on that. When's the last so, uh, time that's your husband's be... been screaming in the middle of the night coming from uh, your house? That's going to be tonight with Vinny. Yes, 1 a.m. again, Dagan. We'll be back to normal here in a couple of days. <laughs> but uh, we'll talk AEW, NXT 2.0, and uh, a lot of other things as well. And I got an idea, a brilliant idea, if I do say so myself, for uh, these, these uh, Battle Royals for the tag title show. I'll tell you about that tonight. And uh, you can check it out, video.f4wonline.com. And uh, that's it, everybody. I'm going to go enjoy. Actually, you know what I'm going to do right now? I'm going to go do some cameos. F4W Online on Cameo, everybody, from Hawaii. Don't miss it. And we're out of here. Thanks, Mike, as always, I guess. Callers and listeners, everybody in the studio. We'll talk to you next time. Wrestling Observer Live.